The pace of development did not diminish in the 30s. There were many new frontiers to be explored. On the 22nd of October, 1938, Captain Mario Pezzi was helped into this cumbersome pressurized suit of armor in order to make an attempt to fly higher above the earth than any pilot had previously done. Sealed into his airplane and wearing an equally cumbersome helmet that was to supply him with vital oxygen, Captain Petsy could operate the controls only with difficulty. Taking off into the sunny afternoon and watched anxiously by the crowd on the ground, Petsy flew his airplane until it would climb no more. Circling ever higher and battling with frozen control lines, he reached a point where the engine could not develop any further power. He turned the aircraft earthward, having reached a record altitude of 56,046 feet. The machine in which Captain Petsy broke the record was designed by Gianni Caproni. However, Caproni was not interested solely in the design of airplanes for sport. My father looked at flight not uh, for an emotion, a sportive emotion. He thought that uh, flying uh, must be useful for something. And so his uh, really big uh, problem was the defense of Italy in each moment of his life. He was thinking that Italy has to be uh, like Switzerland, in peace with everybody, but uh, uh, very strong uh, uh, strategically. With Mussolini's Ethiopian campaign in 1935, the need for transport aircraft became acute. <laughs> Conducting a campaign in such terrain made the use of road transport impractical. This uh, Ethiopia war was extremely interesting because it is a logistical uh, way to proceed. And it is the first and unique uh, thing that Italy organized with German ideas. It was to be a Caproni aircraft that fulfilled the need for tactical support planes. The Caproni 101 had been designed in 1928 as a passenger or freight carrier. Its strong steel lattice construction made it extremely resilient, and it became the backbone of the Regia Aeronautica supply divisions. Some CA-101s were also adapted to carry out bombing missions in Mussolini's bid to subdue Emperor Haile Selassie. In Ethiopia, the Regia Aeronautica had operated without the threat of an opposing air force to contend with. With the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in July 1936, these same airmen were to gain their first experience of combat. In response to an appeal from the Spanish nationalist rebels, Mussolini ordered that a force of bombers and fighters be dispatched to Spain to support Franco's army. The initial flight of Savoia 81 bombers and Fiat CR-32 fighters had expanded within six months to six full squadrons. The number steadily increased until the fall of the Spanish Republic on the 28th of March, 1939. 
mass production of military aircraft was now well established. The Regia Aeronautica was soon to need all the available resources of Italy's designers and manufacturers alike. In 1940, as a result of Mussolini's pact with Hitler, Italy entered the Second World War. Although faced with an aerial war on several fronts, the Italian air crews had experience on their side. The campaigns in Ethiopia and Spain had built a confidence in the abilities of their aircraft, and their combat techniques were well tested. bring together two rivals from the pre-war years in a more deadly contest. The Mackey 202, descendant of the racing red floatplanes of the Schneider Trophy races. Over the desert sands, he was to meet with the ultimate challenge from this supermarine design world, the Spitfire. The old rivalry was undiminished, but now the contest was to the death. The Mackeys, always outstanding as racers, proved themselves no less efficient in their role as destroyers. The experiences of the Italian airmen who served on the Eastern Front were very different. The long and bitter struggle, exacerbated by the extreme cold of the Russian winter, threatened to have a crippling effect on men and machines alike. When the freezing conditions abated, and it was possible to fly the aircraft, these Mackie 200s were capable of outperforming the majority of the opposition that they met in the Russian skies. Nevertheless, the Regia Aeronautica was forced ultimately to withdraw for the first time in its history. Following the armistice with the Allies in September 1943, the few units of the Air Force that continued to fly alongside the German Luftwaffe found themselves increasingly short of essential supplies. The German squadron steadily withdrew northward, and the acute shortage of fuel and spares eventually made any further operations impossible. Little remained from the great years of the Regia Aeronautica. The challenge of rebuilding Italy in the aftermath of the war was a formidable one. No less formidable was the prospect faced by the aviation industry at this time. The future was uncertain for the designers of Italy as the world moved into the jet age. of the situation were bleak, 
The challenge of the new technology was to inspire rather than hinder Italian design. Gianni Caproni had been responsible for Italy's first experiment in jet propulsion in 1940. Together with Secondo Campini, he had developed the Campini Caproni N1, an all-metal monoplane powered by a ducted fan jet engine. Despite the success of the first flight and subsequent trials, the Air Force showed little interest at the time in developing the aeroplane further. So it was that the skies of Italy in the late 1940s and the early 50s were dominated by jet aircraft of American design, such as the Republic F-84 Thunderjet. Supplied initially by the Americans under the terms of the post-war Mutual Defense Assistance Program, aircraft like the F-84 and its successor, the F-86 Super Sabre, were subsequently built in Italy under license by the Fiat Company, who gained very valuable experience in the process. Fairchild boxcar transports were also provided for under the terms of the American agreement. General Guilo Due would surely have approved of their furtherance of the long tradition of tactical support flying, which he had begun in the Western Desert in 1911. While the Air Force was dominated by aircraft that had been conceived in Britain and the United States, Designers at Fiat in Turin were working to develop a new jet aircraft in the Italian mold. The Fiat G91 had been prompted by a NATO requirement for a compact jet interceptor that could be produced in large numbers to equip the various air forces of the Alliance. The career of this airplane was to be long and distinguished. Several versions are still in service today. With the G91, Italian design began to reassert itself in the skies. The intended mass purchase of the G91 did not take place. Due to NATO decisions in the 1960s, which led to the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter being chosen by virtually every NATO Air Force. Serving alongside the Fiat's, the F-104 was a controversial aeroplane, and early variants were not without their operational dangers. The aircraft that provided the basic training for the pilots of these frontline units of the Air Force was the Mackie 326. At Air Mackie's plant in Venegorno, work continued on its successor, the MB339. The 339 is powered by a Rolls-Royce Viper engine. It is in some ways ironic that the latest in the illustrious line of Mackie designs should receive a power plant designed by the company who once powered the rivals of its racing ancestors. Designed to be adaptable to training and attack roles, the 339 has placed Air Mackie in the forefront of aviation technology. It is certainly a worthy heir to the glories of the Schneider racers.
Italy's pioneer aviators that the airplane's contribution to the world would be an entirely peaceful one. It was the dream of many more that if air forces were to be formed, the airplane would act as peacekeeper and not as aggressor. Throughout the century, these hopes and dreams have been shattered all too often by the clamor of war. But the aeroplane itself remains a thing of fascination and of beauty, and no nation can have pursued its development more fervently or viewed it with more passion than the countrymen of Leonardo da Vinci.